I'm sure everyone either knows personally or knows a friend or a family member that's suffered from lower back pain in the past or at some point in their lives. First, we're gonna spend some time talking about some statistics about lower back pain. Then um, we'll move through some case scenarios and these are very common for um, medical students in medical school to kind of learn through case series um, to, to do a deeper dive on lower back pain. And finally, we'll save some time to answer any questions that may arise during this presentation. Now, it's no wonder that someone either you know personally or family member has dealt with lower back pain as dr henry has alluded to lower back pain is actually one of the most commonly reported pain conditions in 2011 the national institutes of health which we've been hearing a lot about throughout the pandemic commissioned a study to look at the the state of research and um, the state of affairs essentially for all pain related conditions and as you can see in the figure in the top right here lower back pain is actually one of the most prevalent or the most common pain complaints um, a, a cause of chronic pain in the US um, in the adult population, way more than knee pain, way more than migraines or neck pain and shoulder pain together. In fact, lower back pain is the leading cause of disability in Americans under the age of 45. And this comes out to be about 31 million Americans experiencing lower back pain at any given point. So, you know, this is between the, the population of California, which is around 40 million, and the population of Texas, about uh, 20 million or so. So that's a huge population of, um, of the United States. And what this turns into money-wise is that if you look at the cost of, um, of treatment for pain, which in 20, uh, 2010, when they did this study, is about 47 billion US dollars. And back pain actually accounts for 75% of that. So an annual cost of $37 million. So you can see why this is a huge public health issue and also why some pain physicians kind of dedicate their entire careers into treating and studying lower back pain. So let's, without any further ado, let's dive into our first case. So this is a, um, a case of um, Mr. John. So John is a 50-year-old man, otherwise healthy. In fact, he uh, loves to play pickleball, which I'm finding out is actually one of the, the hottest growing sports nowadays. Um, but as you all know, this past weekend was pretty gloomy and overcast. So instead of playing pickleball, he was actually clearing out his garage on the weekend. As he was lifting some boxes, he felt a sudden pop in his right lower back, followed by severe, severe sharp pain. Then he shows up to the urgent care, a care clinic to be evaluated. So for John, this is what we would classify as acute lower back pain. Now, there's nothing cute about his lower back pain. But acute simply infers that this is um, a back pain which has been less than three to six months in duration. Now, what would medical school be without some talk about anatomy, right? So let's look at the lower back. In this schematic, I like to point your attention to some of the structures just underneath the skin. Okay, we have muscles which are attached to ligaments, which allow the muscles to connect to bone. And the bony structures form the vertebrae, as you can see here. And in between the vertebrae are, are these discs, which help cushion each individual vertebrae. And together, they make up the spine, which protects the spinal cord, as well as the nerve root or the nerves coming out to innervate the rest of the body. Now, as the nerves come out, they innervate the muscles, which allow us to control uh, movement. The nerves also go to all the structures that we have previously mentioned and carry sensation back to the brain. Sensations like touch, sensations which allow us to tell where our body is in space, and also the sensation of pain. So as a result, Injury or trauma to any of these structures can cause the pain fibers to fire 
and signals and send signals up the spinal cord to the brain to be processed as pain. In this figure, I've just highlighted some of the potential um, areas which could become injured and send out these pain signals. Over here, I've illustrated some back pain or strains, which are very, very common and they often arise after kind of sport injuries, or in this case, kind of um, overuse um, of certain muscles. But it could also come from other disease processes. For example, as we age, the joints of the spine can become arthritic, just like how uh, knees can get arthritic, hips can get arthritic, um, and this can also generate pain. And the, cush the, the discs or the cushions between the vertebrae I pointed out before can also lose their integrity. You can imagine, you know, there's so much force coming down on these discs when we're standing upright with gravity that sometimes they can pancake out simply from being squished so, um, so violently. And as you can see, when they squish outwards, they can cause pain themselves, but sometimes they can also impinge on the nerves coming out or sometimes even the spinal cord. So from this simple picture, I hope you guys can appreciate that there could be a lot of pain generators that cause back pain, but are they all serious and all bad? Well, as pain physicians or as physicians, um, family care uh, physicians, there are some things that we look out for that we call red flags. So when patients present with back pain, plus any of these symptoms, it clues us in to think that there may be a little more than just your typical muscle sprain and strains and may warrant further workup. For example, major trauma such as car accidents may clue us into thinking that perhaps there's fractures or broken bones involved. When there's fevers associated with back pain, it clues us into that potentially there are infections that might go, be going on, especially if people are immunocompromised. Additionally, if there's any weakness, for example, you're not um, when patients aren't able to move their feet or feeling a little um, weaker than usual, sensation changes, um, numbness in the saddle region, bowel or bladder incontinence of so going to the um, number one or number two without even realizing, those might be clues um, that perhaps the nerves or even the spinal cords might be involved as well. When in doubt, it's never a bad idea to check in with your primary care doctor or family doctor. I'm sure actually most of you have probably um, uh, checked in with your primary care physicians expecting to undergo a major workup with MRIs or um, referrals to, to spine surgeons or neurosurgeons, but instead actually get sent home with simply some reassuring um, kind words. Well, why is that? Well, let's look at the management of acute back pain. And, um, and we'll kind of dispel some myths as well as reinforce some facts. As it turns out, the prognosis for acute lower back pain is excellent. So only two out of three, well, two out of three patients that experience back pain don't even show up to their family care, uh, family physicians. Of, the, of that, that one third that do, 90, 70 to 90 of them actually improve by themselves in weeks. So doing nothing may actually be the best thing to do. Now, I do want to distinguish that, distinguish um, doing nothing in terms of interventions or additional workups from actually doing nothing when you're at home. So bed rest, which I'm sure um, everyone's kind of heard of as potentially a treatment for back pain, this was actually an, an, old, um, an old doctrine that is actually um, has been shown to be not actually that beneficial. Bed rest, in fact, can actually worsen pain and slow the recovery. The current recommendations actually encourage people to continue activities of daily living as much as possible. So for in the case of John, even though he may not be able to participate, for example, on his pickleball championship match, um, he is encouraged to continue to, to um, go to work, to, do, um, to take care of everyday, everyday things, brush his teeth, walk around, clean up the house, as much as tolerated. Now, he may have to adjust his activities from the beginning because it may, the pain may be real, really severe, 
but as he recovers, he should continue to build up more and more activity until he's back at his baseline. There are some non-pharmacologic approaches, such as applying heat, massage, acupuncture, or spinal manipulation, such as chiropractics, have all been shown to provide some benefit in terms of helping with acute lower back pain. Now, what's a myth is that um, not each uh, one form of treatment is not better than any other. And this may be because lower back pain, ac acute lower back pain may actually get better by themselves. And so the choice of which intervention, non-pharmacologic approaches one decides to take actually comes down to patient preference, cost, and accessibility as well. Now, there are some interventions or non-pharmacologic treatments that have been studied, but unfortunately have not been shown to provide some benefit. So I've kind of listed some here. So actually, turns out cold, um, the idea is to kind of minimize swelling. But as it turns out, the cold actually doesn't penetrate that far into the back to be really that helpful. Additionally, traction, wearing a brace, changing out mattresses, and doing yoga, those have been studied and unfortunately have not been shown to be helpful. And if medications really are needed, NSAID, so things like Advil, Moltren, Aleve, can be most helpful for acute back pain, as well as muscle relaxants. But before starting any medication, definitely consult with your physician to make sure that there's no other medical conditions or other um, um, issues which may prohibit the safe use of medications if needed. So that covers acute lower back pain. Let's dive next into the second case scenario. So the second patient is Jane. Jane is also 50. Um, she comes to the pain management clinic complaining of lower back pain since before the pandemic started in 2019. Her pain is worse after prolonged standing or sitting, and it actually in even interferes with her sleep. It wakes her up at night. It hurts so bad. She used to work as a software engineer, but now has taken disability because of pain. When you ask her when, you know, how did the pain start or when did it start? You know, she was able to tell you around the year, but she wasn't able to tell you more information than that. For example, there was, there was no heavy boxes, there was no trauma or any sort of inciting event. As you can see, Jane is a very different patient from our first patient. Jane is, has what we would classify as chronic lower back pain. That is, her symptoms have persisted for more than six months. And chronic back pain is really where the challenge lies and where all the statistics that we had explored earlier today really apply to. Whereas we've seen acute lower back pain has great prognosis and just and most of the time resolves all by themselves. So what causes chronic lower back pain? Well, all the causes of acute lower back pain can cause chronic lower back pain, but the picture gets much more complex with chronic lower back pain. And in addition to these biological or mechanical causes like, like I've highlighted previously, oftentimes chronic back pain does involve psychosocial factors and the nervous system. In fact, the nervous system is so powerful the example I like to give is, you know, consider when you're first, first learning how to ride a bike, you know, with training wheels, um, you have to kind of make the conscious effort of, you know, maintaining your balance, one pedal stroke in front of the next. But now, you know, now you think about riding a bike, it, you don't even think about it. You, you know, it's, it's hard to even explain to someone how to begin to ride a bike, yet you're able to do it so easily. And that just shows how powerful the nervous system is at learning, even if you're not trying. And that can happen with back pain or any sort of pain. Over time, the brain might learn how to fire in, in, a, in a way that signals pain. And over time, it may actually learn it as if it was a habit. And 
you know, the, the most extreme form is even without causing, even without tissue damage, the brain can actually, and the nervous systems can start firing as if you were in pain. And that is a, a very difficult version of chronic pain. But chronic lower back pain can, can also take on that form. So let's explore this a little bit by interviewing Jane. So it turns out, in addition to chronic lower back, back pain, Jane has a history of anxiety and depression. Um, before having this pain in 2019, she really enjoyed going out to the movies, um, hanging out with her friends, but because of movies involved sitting for such prolonged periods of time, you know, now she's actually cut out movies altogether. You know, she's pretty withdrawn. She doesn't like to hang out with her friends anymore. And it gives her a lot of anxiety, even thinking about activities that involve prolonged standing. This is a type of behavior that we call fear avoidance. And when you ask her to describe what are some of the things she's tried for her pain or um, what makes her pain better, she, res she responds with things like, oh, this pain will never get better. There's nothing that helps. I've tried everything. This is, I can't, there's nothing else to be done. Um, this, is, this is the very end. Um, so this is a, a type of behavior we call pain catastrophizing. And these may be things that um, Dr. I, Yulia Ivan and Dr. Valerie Jackson had talked about last week um, with pain psychology as well. And now that, she's, now that Jane's on disability, she spends most of her time in bed or lying on the couch. She's not able to clean for herself, cook for herself. Um, so she's got very high functional impairments. Turns out these factors or these examples that I've given have been identified as risk factors for developing chronic pain. Now, these are just risk factors, and I want to emphasize that because it does not mean these things cause chronic pain. Um, so if, if patients have these characteristics, it doesn't guarantee that they're going to develop chronic pain from acute pain. And vice versa is true, that if you don't have these risk factors, it doesn't protect you from developing chronic pain. But these are risk factors that, you know, if patients start to exhibit these kind of um, behaviors or symptoms, that it may predict uh, um, um, a, 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 a transition towards chronic pain. So let's talk about management. Now, this is probably the, the most important slide of the presentation and really summarizes what a pain physician, um, what their expertise um, is and what they bring to the table in terms of helping patients deal with chronic pain. You know, pain is like aging. No one likes it, but unfortunately, it's a part of life. And that's why our specialty is called pain management. And no one calls us pain-free doctors. And that's because, you know, as much as we'd like to get rid of pain completely, sometimes it's just not possible. And our primary goal is to try to help patients manage their pain so that they're still able to do the activities that they enjoy doing. So for example, for Jane, getting her back out so that she's working, so that she's able to enjoy her time with her friends and re-engage with her family. Now, how do we do that? As you've probably figured out by now, kind of just before even this lecture and kind of just in life, is that there's no one intervention or treatment that can solve and take away pain completely. So what are we left with? Well, the analogy I like to use is um, this multidimensional approach. That is using lots of different approaches to chip away at pain. Kind of like when you buy a value meal, you get more bang for your buck by, have, by having lots of different things than to buy them individually. And that's kind of the idea of a multidimensional approach. And a pain physician can help individuals create unique, personalized, multidimensional plans to best fit their pain condition, but also their goals of care. So we'll briefly go through the five pillars that um, any pain plan should incorporate. 
The first one, which I think is the most important one, is functional rehabilitation. So things like physical therapy, um, helping create home exercise programs. But the main goal here is to help incorporate functionality back into people's lives so that they could start doing activities again. They could start um, 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 engaging in society, going back to work. Um, you know, they start being around friends, start taking care of themselves. The second um, pillar here is interventions and procedures. So depending on the cause of pain, there may be certain interventions that pain physicians are able to do to try to dampen the pain signal that's coming into the body. So there are procedures, for example, that can try to calm inflammation we have procedures that can actually help promote regeneration for degenerative diseases. Um, we have interventions that could block the pain nerves from firing. And there are some procedures as you guys will learn about in the upcoming weeks that can actually change how pain fibers fire um, and kind of trick them into firing in, in a non-painful way. So those are kind of um, different interventions that um, can be discussed depending on the type of um, cause for the lower back pain. And we can also make referrals to surgeons to look for surgical options as well um, and kind of help provide insight into surgeries. You know, I wish I could say that surgeries are 100% fixes to all problems, but as I'm sure everyone has heard, there are success stories where after surgery, patients' pains improve. And at the same time, there's also stories that I'm sure you've heard where patients undergo surgery and their pain is not resolved, or worse yet, their pain worsens. There's also medications that can be really effective at treating various pain, um, various types of pains. And the, the pain physicians were experts at kind of matching the type of pain to the type of medications that will work. This often requires a, a relationship over time because not all medications work for everyone. So if you think about blood pressure medications, for example, not all blood medications work at decrease, decreasing blood pressures for everyone. And so it is a trial process um, and that requires kind of trust and time and a, a good therapeutic relationship. And and a lecture about pain would be remiss if we didn't spend some time talking about um, how pain is treated with opioids as well. And that's something we'll do a deeper dive into after I touch on the other two pillars of the multidimensional approach. So as we've kind of discussed with, with Jane, you know, not only does she has chronic, have chronic pain, but she also has these negative or pathologic adaptations to pain. And that's where mind-body interventions and pain psychology can be extremely helpful um, because even though she may have pain signals coming in, um, the mind is very powerful and it can amplify and respond negatively as well as positively to chronic pain. And what we want to do with pain psychology is to make sure that the mind or the nervous system is, was, is retrained in a way that we respond positively and adaptively to pain signals. Things like cognitive behavior therapy, biofeedback, and some of the other um, interventions that Dr. Ivan and Dr. Jackson have discussed last week are kind of the pillars for this intervention. And lastly, the more that we know about complementary and alternative medicines, the more that we're realizing that there's actually a lot of untapped resources here that have been really helpful in terms of managing chronic pain. Um, so for example, lots of different nu uh, nutritional supplements, vitamins and other health supplements have been studied now and shown to be really helpful um, for pain. And some of them are actually more helpful than some of the medications that we prescribe. Um, and, and one actual relevant thing that I see a lot in, in my practice are patients coming in, you know, with the legalization or cannabis products of patients coming in asking about whether or not cannabis, for example, is helpful for pain. You know, at this moment in time, there's still a lot of research that's ongoing, um, some that support its use and others that 
show that it's not really beneficial. So it's a little too early to have a definitive conclusion on that. But you know, with additional research, you know, we've come to realize that, for example, the, the receptors for cannabis are on some of the cells that are involved in processing pain signals. So it's a very exciting area of research um, and also a very exciting area for um, therapies. So now let's dive in and look at um, opioids and how they relate with pain. So I'm sure even before the pandemic, everyone's been reading headlines about the opioid epidemic, the, the lawsuits that are going on with the big pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, and, and I'm sure, you know, this is just a, a, a small sample of all the different headlines um, that are out there. Um, you know, the one thing I'll kind of point out is, you know, with the pandemic, it's actually worsened the the, the COVID pandemic has actually worsened the opioid pan epidemic. Um, and this is multifactorial, but it has to do, it, you know, it could do with, for example, the increased stress, job losses, for example, um, the lack, the, the social isolation from the, the social distancing, but also not being able to access care in the way that people were able to previously. So opioid related deaths have actually increased during the COVID pandemic. Um, in the bottom here is an excerpt, um, I believe from the New York Times, which highlights that opioids are often ineffective for the treatment of lower back pain. And I think even, uh, even more broad stroke, I think, um, you know, I kind of challenged someone to, to share with us um, headlines that actually go somewhere along the lines of, you know, opioid um, doing great for the world and, and curing chronic pain and giving people their lives back um, and, and improving functionality and letting them do things they once enjoyed. And I think that's one of the headlines that's always missing in the news. And that's because the evidence for that is actually very, very small. So let's look at the, uh, the opioid epidemic. So between um, 1999 to 2019, so to a 20 year span, about half a million people have died from an opioid related death. And the, the time curve of opioid related overdose and death in America dates all the way back to the 1990s. And it actually follows three waves down here. So the first wave, back in the 1990s is actually when the pharmaceutical company first started synthesizing um, synthetic opioids, especially the long acting um, synthetic opioids. So things like Oxycontin that you may have heard of in the news. Um, there was a big marketing and advertising push from these pharma uh, pharmaceutical companies for to the physicians. Um, it, they kind of overstated some of the benefits of opioids and downplayed a lot of the potential side effects and um, adverse effects of these medications. And as a result, um, and additionally, they, the physicians were actually getting um, really big kickbacks by prescribing these medications or being, being taken out to lunch. They were being, um, you know, there are lots of uh, lots of gifts to, to promote the physicians um, to prescribe these medications. And as a result, lots of people were put on these medications. And um, as a consequence of that, things like opioid use disorders, opioid abuse, addiction, um, that also started to rise. And that brought about the first wave of the opioid um, ep epidemic. The second wave kind of spun out from the first wave. So now that these people are, are used to seeing opioids, you know, and it's becoming harder and harder to get their hands on it, they are kind of pivoting and looking at other sources of opioid, in this case, the heroin. Um, so this is around the early 2010s, which kind of correlates with this curve right here, the, the orange curve. And, and we won't focus too much about the opioid, um, or sort of the, the heroin, um, and how they kind of make their way into the US, because that's, you know, that's a huge, um, that's a, a different lecture in and of itself, um, the, the, drag, the drug trafficking and the, the business of, of drugs. Um, and then in 2013, 
an even more powerful synthetic opioid was starting to be synthesized and introduced into the streets. And this is fentanyl. And for, for those of you who um, live in San Francisco, we know that fentanyl is, is, is very, very prevalent. Um, and we actually see a lot of fentanyl related um, issues in the emergency rooms in the hospitals here in San Francisco. Um, it is very cheap to produce. It is very easy to produce and it is super, super potent. So, you know, um, the, the potency of fentanyl is about one to 100 of morphine. So for every one of fentanyl is the equivalent of taking 100 morphine. So that's, that's you know, two, two-fold magnitude um, of, of potency. And when that gets mixed into um, medications because it's so cheap, that really, really increases the risk of overdose-related uh, deaths. So in the United States, the states which are hardest hit by the opioid epidemic is actually in um, kind of the southern states. So Kentucky, West Virginia, um, those are the, the worst hit states. But in California, we're not immune either. So this is um, data from 2016, looking at um, California opioid related deaths. And as you can see, the Northern counties, for example, like up in Eureka, Redding, um, as well as the, the more inland um, counties still experience quite a high number of opioid and heroin related deaths in the state. Now let's zoom in into San Francisco. So this is um, kind of a map of San Francisco, just to orient everyone. Kind of, this is the Presidio over here. Here's Golden Gate Park, um, Lake Side out here. Um, and you can see, um, it's, it's a little small, but you can kind of see gestalt-wise, these, um, um, these dots here represent um, opioid-related um, overdose and deaths. And you can see they're, they're kind of distributed throughout the city, but definitely very, very concentrated in the Tenderloin area. So what I'm suggesting is not necessarily that all opioids are bad and that opioids don't work and they should never be prescribed. Um, there, there can be success stories with opioids. However, I think what's more important is that we need to recognize the amount of risk um, is, and to balance that with the amount of risk that one is being exposed to by using opioids. So this is a schematic um, which kind of illustrates some of the, um, some of the system-based um, approaches to, make to making sure that opioids are used in a responsible fashion. And, and here, um, in this first box here, it um, highlights the importance of having um, good self-care, good doctor-patient relationships, and a focus that's not so much on pain severity or, or pain score of, from 1 to 10, but more focused on activities and goals and functional goals. Um, what we know is from big studies about opioids is that when they compared patients on opioids to patient not taking opioids, um, long-term, their pain severity or pain scores are actually the exact same. And looking at their functionality down the line chronically, the two groups are the same as well. So it seems from these major, major studies, there does not seem to be kind of um, a long-term benefit to opioids when, we're, when they're looking just at these outcomes. So it's really important to kind of think long-term. Then considering the use of opioids, you know, like I've suggested, you know, um, evaluating the risks and benefit trade-offs, you know, the, the risk of opioids in addition to opioid-related deaths include things like respiratory depression, so slowing of the breathing, uh, constipation, those tend to be really, really severe ones. Um, opioids often make people very sleepy and kind of cloudy headed and make people feel like they're not themselves. And then also long-term use of opioids can also increase 
cardiovascular risk. So things like heart attacks and strokes, as well as, um, as hormone changes. So low testosterone for males, for example, is a huge problem for people on opioids long-term. So, you know, those are things to be looking out for. Um, and those are things to monitor for, in addition to looking for um, misuse and abuse as well. So that kind of nicely sums up um, one aspect of medication use in our multidimensional approach to pain treatment. So to summarize, um, with regards to acute lower back pain, the majority of acute lower back pain cases will improve with time and that doing nothing or kind of doing as much as tolerated is usually enough and is, is the best approach but can contrast that to chronic lower back pain that can be much more complex and oftentimes is not as simple as kind of the mechanical or the biologic causes of pain. And it often has a really strong psychosocial component as well. These are kind of the, the nervous system factors that I've described earlier. Um, opioids, as I've I just alluded to, have not been shown to improve pain or function long term, but in fact, they've been consistently associated with side effects, including abuse and death. So they need to be used with extreme care and extreme caution. And pain management specialists can help create a personalized treatment plan to treat chronic back pain using a multidimensional approach. So again, the best approach to chronic issues is not through just one intervention, but that value pack of using lots of different interventions at the same time to chip away at the chronic pain issue. Thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to, to having a discussion about any, any of the topics we've discussed today. Thank you so much. Dr. Sue, I really appreciate that talk and it was very good. And I think we do have some questions. The first question is, are there some narcotics that are safer than others that um, my doctor might prescribe for me? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, definitely not all narcotics are, are the same um, and they are used for, for different purposes. Um, in general, I think the current um, the current view is that, um, you know, narcotics should not be the first line medication that's used to treat pain. And when they are used to treat pain, you know, shorter acting medications tend to be better than longer acting medications. Um, and then in terms of the actual different medications, you know, comparing things like Norco to, to morphine to Percocet, um, as these common kind of types of medications that are being thrown out. Um, something that's actually um, a sister to those medications is called buprenorphine. And, the, and often um, the brand name is Butrans or Belbuca or Subutex. These, this is a, a sister medication to the Norcos and the ox, Oxycodones that actually has less tendency to have some of those bad effects that you hear about in the news. So, you know, if we were to start, uh, you know, to start a, an opioid medication, um, you know, I really strongly encourage you to have a discussion with your physician about that medication in particular. Not to say that that is going to work, because as we know, not all medications work for every single person, but from a side effect profile for, for, for the greater community and population, it tends to be safer. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that um, answer. We have a couple other questions. I'll turn to the chat. Um, the questions being asked, can you talk about two aspects of sleep as they relate to low back pain, position of sleep and mat mattress firmness? You know, unfortunately, I'm not a, a good sleep expert, so I can't really attest to, you know, the, the best sleeping position. I've, you know, I've had colleagues who've kind of told me about things here and there, but I'm kind of reticent to kind of report that because I have never, I haven't had the opportunity to kind of vest through the research and data to kind of give advice about that. Um, 
the same same with the the mattress firmness as well. Um, what I can talk about in terms of sleep and as it relates to lower back pain or just pain in general, is that the quality of the sleep, however, I think is is most important and perhaps more important than the position of sleep. We know that sleep kind of feeds into pain. So people who have poor sleep patterns actually experience more severe pain um, and that um, and, and vice versa. And people that um, get uh, well-rested sleep tend to experience less pain severity as well. Is there any recent data on whether opiate-induced hyperanalgesia occurs in patients on long-term low-dose opiates. I've seen data on high-dose patients, but not low-dose. Opioid-induced hyperalgesia is this concept that, um, you know, if you think about the nervous system, you know, our, our body is, is so good at maintaining a, a uh, a, a straight line, what we call homeostasis. So a, a good example of homeostasis, for example, is, is body temperature. You know, our body, our body tries to maintain a set temperature. If you're too hot, you start sweating to try to bring down your body temperature. If you're too cold, you start shivering to try to generate heat to restore the set point. So the, the same analogy can be thought about in terms of, of pain and, and, and a, a degree of, you know, pain state and analgesia or less pain state. So our body kind of tries to maintain this set point. And when you give someone opioids, what it does is actually it drives this, it kind of temporarily drives this set point down towards pain-free zone. And because your body tries to maintain this, uh, this set point, opioid-induced hy hyperalgesia is this concept that, you know, because you're always exposed to opioids and it's bringing the system down, the nervous system is going to compensate and actually become more sensitive to pain. And so by giving opioids, even though you're trying to bring down pain, you're actually driving your whole nervous system to become, become more sensitive and wanting to fire in a painful fashion. So that's kind of the idea of opioid hyper uh, induced hyperalgesia. And that's definitely been shown and seen in, in opioid um, in chronic opioid users. Now, is, is there a higher propensity um, for people to develop opioid-induced hyperalgesia when you're using lower doses compared to higher doses? I don't, you know, I don't think we kind of know the answer to that question because you know, the, where we kind of run into problems and where it actually gets reported is when people are on high-dose opioids because on high-dose opioids, everyone's kind of very vigilant about the amount of opioid they're using, the amount of refills they're getting. So it's, you know, we're kind of primed to kind of catch people when they're on high doses, when all of a sudden they need more or they're, uh, you know, when they're experiencing more pain. Whereas for the low doses, you know, you know, with the lower doses, it tends, um, you know, they're less likely to fluctuate their doses and perhaps it's a matter of reporting, um, but can it occur? For sure, in the operating rooms, for example, we will use IV um, opioids to treat pain and we'll use very low doses. And even in the operating room with low doses, when we're actually looking at these people and monitoring them all the time, we do see that even after a single dose, single small dose of opioids, that they do develop this tendency to need a higher dose um, or which. We, in, we kind of interpret as that they are in more pain. Um, Interesting. So That's hopefully very, it answers very your question. Um, another attendee asks, can you elaborate on the procedures that promote regeneration, regenerative techniques? Yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, um, thank you for asking that question. It's definitely one of the more new areas that um, pain physicians are kind of venturing out to. So traditionally, for, for pain procedures, we inject a lot of steroid injections, for example, to try to calm down inflammation. Or we do a lot of nerve blocks or nerve zapping or ablations where in which we kind of burn the nerves. So these are all kind of um, traditional methods that tend to destroy um, or kind of block the nerve from firing. Now, there's another school of thought that, hey, maybe we're in pain because you know, our body naturally wants to, to clear and heal whatever injuries has happened. But, 
maybe the pain is there because the, the body just wasn't able to, to finish the job. Maybe they cleaned, you know, maybe 50, 80% of the, the injury and they kind of left the rest there. And maybe it's the rest of the stuff that wasn't cleared up that's causing the pain. With these regenerative approaches, what we do is actually, you know, we're not, you know, we, we inject things like um, sometimes sugars, we inject um, uh, kind of viscous supplements, kind of like cartilage kind of supplement material. And sometimes we even inject um, patients own blood after we purify them. And these factors that we think we inject into the area kind of induce and promote this other wave of inflammation and recruit some of these cells from the patient's own body back to the area with the goal of, hey, you know, maybe by doing this, we can kind of tell the body to, to, to recognize that, hey, you're not done cleaning up the things that cause pain. Why don't you come back and kind of finish up the, the rest of the cleanup? So that's kind of the, the school of thought about how this regenerative approach um, of interventions work. Very exciting. I love um, the regenerative aspects and a lot of patients are interested in that. And do you provide this at the clinic now, Dr. Sue? Yeah, these are definitely interventions that we do at the clinic. In fact, we kind of invested in one of the, the newer um, technologies that allow us to do these things where we kind of purify blood and inject them into patients to try to promote this regeneration. regeneration. That's excellent. We have a, a attending named um, Catherine, and she wanted to know, in the early on in your presentation, you mentioned um, a chart on acute pain and showed red flags. One was bladder incontinence. What is the connection? Is it causal? And if so, which way? Bladder or bowel incontinence means, you know, um, you know, obviously there's sometimes as we age and for other reasons, we develop bladder incontinence and that um, is due to lots of different etiologies. In terms of red flags as it relates to bladder incontinence um, is when, when, the, when the nerves that kind of go from the spinal cord to the bladder get compressed by for whatever reason because of a bulging disc, for example, a fracture or some sort of trauma that happens and it's so severe that it actually impinges on those nerves that those nerves are not able to fire to the bladder to control the bladder emptying, then that's kind of what we mean by, by bladder incontinence. And this is different from kind of the, um, the kind more common types of bladder incontinence, for example, stress incontinence or urge incontinence that sometimes people develop with, with older age. Um, so ho I hope, hopefully that kind of clarifies it a little bit. Yes, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, another attendee wanted to know, are you a fan of those gravity inversion devices that allow one's spine to leverage gravity for relief? Yeah, so um, the inversion tables or even sometimes the traction tables that kind of essentially allow, um, allow alleviate essentially the stress of gravity. Um, those are helpful for kind of temporary relief that I've kind of seen from patients. I think, you know, um, if that provides benefit, I think there's very low risk. I think that, but, you know, I would not solely rely on that for, uh, as a pain management um, intervention. I would couple that with the physical therapy to kind of strengthen, for example, the muscles of the lower back so that it's able to support when you are upright and when you have to um, kind of battle gravity. Because unfortunately, as, as, as good as they feel when you're under those traction devices, a lot of times, once you stand back up and you have to go around your business, the pain often recurs simply because now the forces are driving back down again. This is an interesting question, especially uh, for us in San, uh, San Franciscans. Is all that walking up and down the hills or stairs something that keeps our spine stronger or is it more wearing on us and is it wearing us as, as out more quickly? For, for the longest time, for knee arthritis, for example, um, we thought that, hey, people develop arthritis because they're walking too much. They're using the knee way too much. And so that's encouraging, um, encouraging the knee to break down. So that turns out to be false, that arthritis can develop even if you somehow didn't use your legs or didn't use the knee at all and, and didn't move your entire life. And that, you know, it's perhaps kind of just with time 
regardless of how often you use it, that this develops. So the same thing can kind of happen as well with the lower back and the spine. And so I think now, especially for chronic pain, what I advise patients is that, you know, motion is, is lotion and you want to keep moving, you know, as, as long as you've been evaluated for your lower back pain and they've ruled out some sort of structural issue where your spine's unstable and that moving is actually dangerous and it could actually lead to more issues, then I would say, you know, move as much as you can, climb as as much hills or downhills as, as possible. And that will actually kind of keep things in, in motion. Motion kind of generates lubrication for the back, it strengthens the muscles. And so, so I would say um, maybe the, the opposite is that it's actually good for you. Excellent news to hear that, especially since we live in San Francisco, there are so many hills. When you evaluate a patient, how do you decide to start a medicine versus begin with a procedure? Is that something you decide on your own or is this something you discuss with the patient? What weighs into your decision when you develop a treatment plan? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, um, with, with today's day and age, um, especially in San Francisco, you know, a lot of our patients have uh, an idea of kind of what they want for their treatment. They, they're very engaged. They've, they've, you know, read lots um, about their, their condition before they even get in here. Um, and so they're actually very interested in kind of being partners in kind of coming up with treatment modalities. And so oftentimes, then that's why, you know, every plan between one patient to the next is very different because it depends on what the patients um, are interested in. You know, what I would say um, is most patients, you know, depending on where they are in life, um, some people, don't like medications. They've tried lots of medicines in the past. It's not great. It hasn't worked well for them. They're very sensitive or they, um, you know, for example, they have jobs that don't allow them to take certain medications, for example. Um, and there's also other patients who, you know, they, they, they don't like needles. And they, the, the last thing they want is to have someone come at them with a, a needle of any sort. And so, you know, they want their treatment to be tailored and focused just on medications and and functional rehabilitation and pain psychology, for example. But in, in general, I, you know, my approach is to, like I've presented, is to try to incorporate all five pillars of treatment because we know that that's gonna be the most effective versus just isolating and using, using one modality by itself. How are the spinal discs attached to bony parts um, uh, attached to the bony parts, they separate. And then is there an artificial or replacement option? I'm not sure if you covered the artificial part. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So between the vertebrae themselves is this, uh, this substance we call the disc, which is kind of like a, think about it like a, like a little cushion, a little gel that kind of buffers the up and down forces and also allows the spine to bend in motion. Um, over time, especially with age and especially with um, smoking, it tends that disc, which is usually filled with fluid and, and water so that it can be really flexible, tends to dry out. And as it dries out, it loses height. And that's why also, as we get older, we tend to kind of decrease in height. Um, that over time, as the, and that degenerates, and sometimes it happens just simply because of age, that be, that can become a pain generator in and of itself. Um, and, and there are procedures to replace the disc. Um, there are artificial discs that can be kind of got, go in there um, and kind of preserve the, the height of the disc. There are also procedures, and these are procedures done by um, surgeons typically. And there are also procedures where you can go in and, and take out the disc completely and kind of maintain that height by simply fusing the two discs or the two vertebrae at, at a set height. So those are different options as well. You know, unfortunately that starts to venture outside um, the realms of my expertise as a pain physician, but you know, we work closely with surgeons to kind of make those referrals and to make sure that patients kind of get those information if that's something they're interested in as well. This is an interesting question that was posted. I have myself have not seen any data on this, but the question is with more cars equipped with airbags, have you seen 
less incidence and or severity of spinal injuries? Interesting question, but I'm not sure if I've seen anything recent on this. Yeah, very, very interesting question. I think, um, you know, I think both you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Henry and I have seen quite a few of, um, you know, car accident, motor vehicle accident patients that come in for back pain. And what's interesting is that most of them actually don't complain so much about lower back pain. And they get, they complain a lot more about cervical neck pain. And I think that's because more of the, the whiplash injuries. I think with the car, the way this, and the, again, this is kind of just me hypothesizing here, but a lot of car seatbelts, if you kind of look at the, the way they're structured, there's actually not much mobility to move in the hip and the lower back region. The, the two kind of seatbelts come together and kind of they straddle right across the waist. So when there's some sort of high impact or, or, or sudden stop, there, the, the lumbar spine actually does not get to move that much because that seatbelt locks in before you know, you're able, even able to fly forward. Whereas the neck, you know, that's not really secured at all. And a lot of whiplash injuries can happen um, as a result of motor vehicle accidents. I agree with that theory. I think that's, that's probably very accurate. We have another question in the chat. How, uh, how do you describe the way you collaborate with acupuncturists? Is the state of relations with alternative mode providers evolving? Oh, definitely, definitely. I think, you know, acupuncturists, um, chiropractors, for example, nutritionists, um, these are all kind of complementary and alternative pra practitioners that um, as we're learning more and more about the efficacies of these therapies, you know, we're kind of starting to be much more collaborative and embracing of each other's practices. I think, you know, for example, for acupuncture, there are certain conditions that are really good or that, that respond quite well to acupuncture. So a lot of musculoskeletal things, um, you know, sometimes neuropathic pain also responds to um, acupuncture. And so for that reason, I, all, I, you know, I, very, I encourage a lot of my patients to seek out these opportunities. Now, I will say in terms of kind of the acupuncture, chiropractic, um, and a lot of the alternative uh, approaches, a lot of insurance companies, you know, still kind of are holding back in terms of allowing kind of free collaboration between them. Because even if I refer my patients to acupuncture, for example, some of them insurance plans will not um, will not allow them to 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 go see certain ones, and um, because they're not covered. So I, I would say that becomes more of the barrier than you know, us kind of being able to have a discussion about that. Absolutely. I think that's what one of the things we run into the most. We want to offer these to patients, but then there can be a roadblock with insurance. Yeah. And that's probably one of the more frustrating aspects of our job, but uh, sometimes we can work around that, but excellent yeah. what you brought up. Yeah. Well, and I thought this was a great talk and the question and answer session was quite lively. There were a lot of things I learned as well. I think um, you can, you've been, you always learn something and every question brings something new. And I really appreciate yeah. that. And, and, and thank you for answering those questions. So um, again, thank you for speaking with us today. And thank you so much for attending this lecture and have a great evening. Mm -hmm.